and shakers in geek culture. Hey, this is Todd McFarlane, creator of Spawn, and one of the original founders of Image Comics. I'm Zach Whedon. This is Mark Zickby, writer, producer, and director of Space Command. Hi, this is George Ascienti. I'm Ralph Bakshi. Hi, I'm Chris Hardwick. People who get it, get it. God bless the geek. They're listening. You're consuming. You're watching it with your ears. Oh, just listen. The Geek Speak Show is powered by Collider.com, GeekTyrant.com, Ramascreen.com, and Mightyville.com. Get ready to speak geek on the Geek Speak Show. Here's your host, Henry. And today we're also powered by The Force and Rachel, of course. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Hey, Rachel. Hey, how are you? Doing fantastic. How are you? I am also doing fantastic. There was a, a little bit of news that happened to come out uh, this last week, and I'm rather excited. I think it's safe to say it's just a little bigger than the Disney acquires Lucasfilm announcement and the episode seven, eight, and nine announcement. Well, it's right up there. We'll, well it's an answer. That. We'll put it that way. It's an answer, and it comes from somebody who usually doesn't give us any answers to anything. You know, um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Anybody? Where's there you are? Yeah, Jay saying, uh huh. So we decided, you know what, let, let's talk Star Wars, not just because Rachel's here and she's like, she was just asked her, she was her, she's the biggest Star Wars fan in the universe, known and unknown, but we have one of the hosts of, well, it used to be Forcecast, now it's Rebel Force Radio, you can find them on rebelforceradio.com, it's still the same great program that they had before, Jimmy Mack is on with us, Jimmy, welcome to the Geek Speak Show. Thanks, Henry, how are you guys doing? Doing great, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure, hey, you know what, I, I really like... Your show open. It's it's got a very professional top forty sound, and as yeah, someone who them. works in the radio industry, I can really appreciate that. Yeah, hey, we fooled you. He actually thinks we were professionals here. <laughs> 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 no, but thanks, Jimmy. Uh, no, but um, but again, we, like I said, we're going to talk about uh, this. This there's no we we tried to stay. We talk on on you guys obviously talk about Star Wars because it's the Rebel Force Radio. What else would you talk about? But on this show, the Geek Speak Show, we talk about anything, comic books, video games. And since, uh, when was it, October, we've been trying to stay away from Star Wars, but there's no way you can with all everything that's coming out. One of the biggest questions that's still out there is, you know, what's, what it's, what's it going to be about? The second biggest is, who's going to direct? Well, we have an answer. Officially confirmed, J.J. Abrams going to be director and producer of Episode 7, maybe 8 and 9. We don't know. So I'll start. Jimmy, you're our guest, so you, I'll, we'll let you go first. What were your thoughts yes. when you first heard? Wow. Uh, my thoughts when I first heard J.J. Abrams is going to be the director of Star Wars. Um, probably a sense of relief. Um, happy that it's not going to be M. Night Shyamalan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I like a few of his films, but I just don't feel his style would fit Star Wars. And speaking of style, there is a Star Wars style. And a lot of people have been making those lame lens flare, flare jokes about J.J. Abrams or talking about how he shakes the camera around and moves uh, sometimes at a very frenetic pace. But I think Abrams is the type of guy who's going to be able to recognize the style in which the Star Wars films have been presented in the past and try to maintain that sense of consistency moving forward. Not saying he's going to ape George Lucas's style necessarily down to the core, but at that core, you'll find there could be a consistency. So Abrams will be trying to make something that looks like Star Wars as opposed to push his own sort of style onto the way he shoots the film. That's what I'm hoping. I hope that with Abrams, you'll get not only a guy who respects the past of the franchise, but is also someone able to work within the standards that have already been established by the franchise. So we get that level of consistency. There's no doubt he's very passionate about the material. In many ways, he reminds me of a young George Lucas, even by the way he sort of looks. He kind of resembles a young George Lucas. So I think that the franchise is in safe hands moving forward. Rachel, what do you think? That That's actually really funny because I, I had the same feeling. There would have been very few people that could have been announced as director that I would have actually sat and, and taken a breath, like you said, and almost been relieved at. And Abrams was one of them. Anyone else, the, that those same feelings from when you know Disney was announced with, of anger and confusion and don't ruin my favorite thing in life, you know what I mean, would have 
would have came back up. But with Abrams, I, I think to your point, he has that consistency, but the respect for the franchise, the respect for what's already been done and implemented is there with him. And sure, he's going to take it a little further and try to push the envelope a little bit, but he does have that where he wants to keep it feeling like Star Wars or in, you know, even what he's done, feeling like Star Trek. So um, I'm really excited. And I think that now I can relax a little bit and, and just be excited that there's a new movie coming out. Yeah, that's for me, uh, you know, no secret here on the show. I've mentioned it many times. I am a huge J.J. Abrams fan, all the way back from even, I would say even before Alias. He had a few shows on the, uh, I guess it was still the WB back then. They weren't genre or anything, but, you know, for Alias, Lost, of course, everything he's done in, in the movies, Super 8 was the last thing he did. Mm-hmm. I, I really like what, what he does. And, 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 Jimmy, I know you said he's like a George Lucas. I would say he's actually more like a young Steven Spielberg. The, his his storytelling style and the way he directs things. I mean, Super 8, perfect example of that, was his hello there to Steven Sp- It was even produced by Steven Spielberg, which is fine because, as we all know, uh, it was a secret, but a uh, secret's out now. Steven Spielberg was a secret director on episode 3. And, you know, from the beginning, from the, after the crawl, all the way to where Obi-Wan says, another happy landing, that was all Steven Spielberg. The end. I never heard that before. Yeah. What I've heard uh, before specifically is Spielberg helped out with some of the previs and storyboards um, with the duel between Obi-Wan and Grievous as they uh, went through the caverns on, uh, on um, um, oh, what was that planet? Why am I having a brain fart on whatever planet? Who cares? When he was uh, we know what you mean. <laughs> in that duel with Grievous. Um, and then uh, also he uh, may have contributed a little bit to the Anakin Obi-Wan. Uh, sword fight, but uh, no, 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 no. He was he was not a a, a ghost director by yeah. Well, well that's, let me clarify. I don't mean he was behind the camera, but he he did have a lot of input, and you can you can tell it feels like a Spielberg film because one thing Spielberg has always been good at in all his movies is balancing perfect balance between drama, action, pulling at the heartstrings. It was all there. Uh, uh, episode one was it, it felt like the original Star Wars, but there was there wasn't that much human feeling to it if that makes sense you guys know what i mean well there there was more that something that tugged at you internally in episode three and 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 just because of what was going on i think that helped but i i understand what you're saying because three is actually my favorite of the prequels because of that because it has so much that that draws inside of you yeah now the other reason i like the jj choice is because you know, when, when Lost first came out, the reason why they all loved each other, Damon and, and J.J. and Brian Burke and everybody from Bad Robot, is they're Star Wars kids. They're like us. They're from the Star Wars generation. They grew up. They they do what they do because, like us, they sat in the theater and were mesmerized by the Star Destroyer coming over us, Chewbacca, Darth Vader, all that stuff. So who better than somebody who was sitting there in the beginning to continue it on? They they, they, they get it, like us. They they get it. They 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 know what the story is. And like like Jimmy, you mentioned it. I don't I don't think they're gonna ape what George Lucas did. I mean, no, nobody can. That's you know, George Lucas is a visionary. Will always he's like a, he's our Walt Disney for this generation. So you, there's no way he's gonna ape what uh, anyone is what George Lucas did. But he does get it, and he will respect that and move forward with it. Uh, let me ask both you guys. Have you guys? Did you guys I'm, I'm assuming you both saw the. Uh, his 2009 Star Trek? Yes. yes. Did you guys think it looked like Star Wars? Because that's what I hear a lot. It's, it's like Star Wars. It's like Star Wars. Um, no, I, you know, it, it might have had a little bit more action than you're accustomed to getting from a typical Star Trek film or episode. But I don't think that it was necessarily feeling more like Star Wars than Trek. But I it agree with you. It was like a, an amped up version of the Star Trek we know. Yeah. And of course, Abram said he wanted to infuse a little bit more of the spirit of Star Wars into Star Trek. And I think that's what he was shooting for was just as far as the action goes. That's um, that was probably a goal he established. Just if there's going to be action, make it feel like Star Wars. But at the core, it was a Star Trek film and all the typical character archetypes and everything were firmly in place. And um, just, like I said, just amped up a little bit. Right. He had it grounded and it, it still felt like Star Trek to me. But like I said before, he just took it that one step further. And I actually I mean, I love him for that. I absolutely love that movie. and I'm so excited about Into the Darkness. So, yeah, it, he, he knows what he's doing, I think. And I think it's going to be safe. Udapau. 
That yeah, was the planet. The where, plan. That was the planet where <laughs> Grievous and Obi Wan were dueling. Utapal. Yeah. Just um, came back. What was I say? Oh, the with the announcement with the JJ announcement also came. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but the JJ has kind of said that yeah, he hasn't agreed to the 2015 release date. Now that I think that's a good thing because I, I I think I mentioned it last year when we, when it was first announced. I thought it was going to be a, a little bit rushed if if they were shooting for 2015. Right. So what do you what do you guys think of that? If if it is going to be pushed back, well, number one, you don't know how much pre production work has already happened as far as the conceptual stage and maybe even beyond the storyboarding. Bringing on board a director at this point, with all of that that pre production firmly in place at this time, and I think there is a lot more pre production in place than we know. I think that they'll just slot in JJ and he'll really start to develop it. And I think they're definitely going to want to keep on that schedule and get the film out in 2015. But as we know, Abrams does have a history, especially, you know, we're talking about that Star Trek film, that release date moved around quite a bit, uh, even to the point where film posters were already put out with a date earlier in the year. And then the film came out later in the year. So, Abrams does have a track record of doing things like that. And if it means just to make a better episode seven experience, then yeah, I think fans will be patient and will wait if there is a delay. But I think right now, especially with the efforts from Lucasfilm, considering that they're postponing the release of Star Wars prequels in 3D to solely focus all their resources on developing, filming, and distributing Star Wars Episode Seven, I think that's a good sign from the company saying, no, you know, we're moving full full steam ahead. We're going for 2015, and we're going to give J.J. Abrams everything he needs to make that happen. Now, actually, you know, going on something you mentioned there, it's if, if there was some previs and, and some, um, some stuff planned out already, does that still make it J.J.'s vision and also Michael Arndt, who's writing the, uh, the screenplay? Well, I think we're dealing with a, a collaboration here. No question about it. The uh, The story is actually coming from George Lucas. That's he, right. He uh, handpicked who was going to be writing at least episode seven. I believe, I believe the same creative team will be in place for the entire trilogy. But he did handpick Michael Arndt. And uh, from what I understand, there were several writers who submitted scripts or at least stories based on these outlines that George Lucas himself developed. So really, if you want to talk about vision, it is going to be a collaboration. It starts with George, then it moves through the writing team who George personally handpicked. And now to the director who was hired by Kathleen Kennedy, J.J. Abrams. And you mentioned Steven Spielberg. There was a lot of lobbying going on behind the scenes by Spielberg for Lucasfilm to hire J.J. Spielberg was behind the scenes working both J.J. and Lucasfilm to make this happen because he believes in J.J. so much and he thinks J.J. Abrams is the perfect fit for the Star Wars sequel trilogy. So it all kind of comes together. And you'll also see more from Lucas, I believe, as this film goes into production. Yes, he still will maintain his retirement status but i'm sure they're going to have george on speed dial and there's gonna be many questions to ask him about what would happen in certain characters eyes or certain situations or little plot holes here and there they might be leaning on george to help them fill that in so you're dealing with a lot of people also lawrence kasdan another star wars veteran he's in the mix too so I think when you start, at the end of the day, it will be a J.J. Abrams film, but the story and everything within it is going to come from several different sources working together to make the best possible Star Wars film they can. So we're talking Star Wars, the J.J. announcement, the little announcement that just came uh, earlier, earlier last week. We, we, it sounds like we're all happy about it. Every, uh, so far on the internet, uh, I think everybody is happy about it too. You're gonna have usual like, like Jimmy Mack again. M- Jimmy Mack is our guest, by the way. He uh, he's one of the hosts for Rebel Force Radio. He used to um, be one of the hosts for uh, Forcecast, the official the Force.net podcast. But now Rebel Force Radio. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, actually, in the second segment, we'll talk a little bit more about that and what's going on with them. Right now, like I mentioned, we're talking about the J.J. Abrams announcement. He is directing, yes, confirmed, no rumors. He is directing and producing Star Wars Episode Seven, whatever it's going to be called. 
No lens flares, no none of that stuff. You know, the jokes are out there and all that. I don't think we're going to see that. This is the point, though, where all three of us can geek out the, the, the way we, the, as the Star Wars fans, that we really are. Again, this is all speculation, but what do, you, what do you guys hope we see? Do you want it to be a continuation or the ending of the Han, Luke, Leia, Lando stories, or should it be? I heard a report that, that they're thinking that Chloe Grace Moretz, friend of, the, friend of our show, should be one of the protagonists. Uh, uh, do you want it to go that way or go ahead and finish the Han, Luke, and Leia story? Well, I think uh, you're going to see a passing of the torch from... Uh, or the lightsaber. Or the, or the lightsaber from uh, Han, uh, or from Luke and Leia and Han to uh, the next generation of Jedi. Uh, Chloe Moretz, God, she's a marvelous actress. I, I love her. If they could find a place for her on uh, the next Star Wars film, that would be amazing. Um, but I think that's what we're going to be seeing here. We're going to be seeing... Uh, you know, the, the next generation, so to speak, come up in this trilogy. And what I speculate as happening, and, and again, pure speculation, but I think we're going to see Han, Luke, and Leia with the next generation working together throughout this trilogy. And then it'll be followed up by another trilogy featuring Star Wars The Next Generation. So... We could be looking at several years of Star Wars films, two trilogies plus spin-off films in between that jump all over the timeline. You could have a film about Vader and Sidious. You could have a film about Boba Fett. You could have a film about Mace Windu. Granted that by the time they get to do that, Samuel Jackson is still young enough to play the role. But um, because you have to have Sam Jackson as Mace Windu, I couldn't imagine anyone else playing Mace Windu. Other but than you Sam. know what, though, he, he can he can do young, old, or whatever. Even right now, we've seen him. I mean, look, look at him from Django Unchained, and look what he looked like as Nick Fury. Yeah, how about it? You know, the guy is what 61, 62 years old, and yeah. he really looks fantastic. I mean, he's just in great shape, and, and there's nobody in Hollywood who doesn't like Samuel Jackson. So if they can bring him back as Mace Windu, that would be that would be fantastic because his character didn't really get the spotlight shown on him as much as I kind of wanted to see in the prequels. So. The possibilities are endless right now, but uh, focusing on what's coming up here in Episode 7, yes, I believe we'll see Han, Luke, and Leia together again, uh, possibly the death of Han Solo, um, Luke Skywalker acknowledging some galaxy-wide threat. I, I hope it's not the Sith. I really don't because I like to see the prophecy of the Chosen One be taken seriously and given the respect as a story, uh, as a story part that it deserves. But... Um, There'll be some there'll be some serious threat and Luke will have to gather up some new Jedi to take on whatever this threat is. I'd also like to see the Jedi Spirit Council featuring Yoda, Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon Jinn. That would be Anakin awesome. Skywalker, and Anakin Skywalker. So you'd have the Spirit Council and they would be advising Luke as he develops a new council of Jedi or at least reestablishes the Jedi Order with the next generation of Jedi. Who could it be? Could it be Luke's son? Could it be Luke's daughter? Of course, Han and Leia had a, two sons and a daughter in the uh, expanded universe books. I don't know if they're going to lean on that material or not. I tend to believe that Luke Skywalker will have a daughter who will lead the Jedi into the next age of Star Wars. And that is where Chloe would come in. That would be perfect. Now... Does somebody have to go? One of the front of the originals, Han, Luke, Leia. Does somebody have to go? Does like, have do to we die? Have... Well, probably. I mean, we've already mentioned that there, there's probably going to be something that's pulling away, and and the passing of the lightsaber, right? Um, but a, a, as we're talking about directly what's going on for for seven and how to pass that over, I'm kind of hoping to see like Luke in his, him rebuilding the Jedi Temple, like when he starts his own academy and and goes through and finds that next generation, like that initial, uh, you know, starting point of him, okay, I need to rebuild the Jedi here. So that would kind of be a nice jumping off point. And then to your point, uh, Jimmy, the side movies that could be, there definitely needs to be a bounty hunter movie for sure. Everyone's been dying for that on the internet already. Rachel, especially. Yeah. Well, yes. All of the classics, get them all together. Boba Fett, Bosk, Dengar, 
four lime. IG88. IG88. Come on. Who doesn't want to see IG88 in action in a live action Star Wars film? That would just be balls out. So, yeah, the possibilities are endless. And that's why I'm really enthusiastic and really excited about the future of Star Wars under the Disney umbrella. Yeah, regardless of what happens, I mean, the, what I want to see, honestly, I, Rachel, I don't know where you are, Jimmy, I don't know where you are in life. I'm glad that I'm going to get to experience with my son and daughter the way I experienced Star Wars, lining up, you know, going to midnight showings, uh, being there with the family, watching at, at the Long Gone Corner Theater here in San Francisco, kids dressed up as Vader, later as uh, Maul, fighting the lightsaber. So the lightsaber's lighting up just as the, the lights go down. All that stuff is really what I'm looking forward to. The, the, the movies, that's just icing on the cake. That's really what I'm looking forward to. We're going to have that under JJ and Kathleen and everybody that, that's going to lead Star Wars into the future. Yeah, it's exciting times are ahead. And, uh, you know, it was great to sort of relive your childhood when the prequels came out and get all enthusiastic about Star Wars coming back into the theaters again. But now we've been through all that and we're sort of veterans at it now. And it's just it's become more than just a little nostalgic, uh, you know, attempt to capture an era that has faded away. Instead, it's become its own era and it's alive and vibrant and it's become lifestyle for many Star Wars fans. Yes, it wanna, has. Yes, who want to take it, you know, push it to the next level, who want to, you know, run a website or a podcast or do cosplaying and go to conventions and just surround yourself in the the energy of fandom. That's what is really the big bonus here. Yeah, and speaking of podcasts and things all, and all things Star Wars, we'll talk about it on this show, of course. We cover everything else. But there is one place that you can consider your source for the fours. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, we'll tell you. We'll let Jimmy actually tell you all about that. So stay right there. The Geek Speak Show will be right back. Are you ready? Here's a Geek Speak Show quickie. So while we take a break... Talking Star Wars, J.J. Abrams, Rachel will be back with uh, Jimmy Mack. Let's uh, say hello to somebody who's been on the show before. He has done the phenomenal film documentaries. You remember those? Star Wars Begins, Building Empire, Returning to Jedi, Raiding the Lost Ark. Jamie Benning is back on with us, creator of film documentaries. Hey, Jamie, welcome back to the Geek Speak Show. Hey, Henry, thanks for having me back. Yeah, pleasure having you back. So, so the last time you were on, you, you, you actually you mentioned that you were just thinking about doing the Jaws film documentary you've gone ahead and started so so where are you on uh, inside jaws um it's always difficult to say with these things because they kind of uh, grow organically as you make them um and you almost have to make a decision to stop making them rather than finish um you know reach reach a, a proper end you kind of just have to release it out there but what happened and since last speaking to you was uh, one of the big jaws collectors in the u.s um, who runs jawscollector.com uh, a guy called Jim Bella got in contact and had seen my my Raiders and my Star Wars film documentaries and said, hey, could you make one for Jaws? You know, I can send you loads of material. I know loads of stuff. He's like my online Jaws guru. If I've got a question about um, Jaws um, that I can't get answered quickly by searching through the dozens of books and magazines and online portals that I now have. And uh, um, I just give Jim a quick shout and uh, he's able to answer it for me. So um, as we stand at the moment, um, the, f- the timeline of the film is pretty much full up. Um, I've got a lot of commentary. I've got probably less behind the scenes material in terms of footage than I would have on the others. I think that's partly because of the age of the film itself. Uh, and, you know, back in 1974, there wasn't that um, technology readily available as it was uh, perhaps in, you know, the latest. 70s and early 80s with the other films so struggling a little bit on that side of things but I have managed to get quite a few interesting little snippets and bits that even people like Jim Bella this uh, big Jaws collector guy I haven't heard of so hopefully it will do something different than um, you know the, the shark is still working or any of those documentaries have done before yeah, and actually, funny you mentioned that. I, I follow your blog, filmmentaries.com, which you all can go there directly. Or just go to our link section. It's on there for you. And, and one of the posts you mentioned that to you, you felt that Inside Jaws has turned out to be a little bit different than the other filmmentaries you've done. How, how so? How, are they, how is it different? I think each one is a little bit different because it's always about working what 
with what material is available. Um, this has turned into more of a. I try. What I've tried to do is try not to use the same old stories that you always hear about. You always hear about Richard Dreyfus talking about the shark is not working <laughs> and all this stuff, and you always hear about the uh, you know the lion. We're going to need a bigger boat, um, and, and that it was improvised. I've got a bit of a different angle on that, for instance. Um, so I'm trying to dig a little bit deeper. And one of the things that's always interested me about Jaws is the fact that they used so many local people. Um, so, you know, they wanted a doctor. They cast a local doctor. Shari Rhodes, the, the casting um, lady, would, would go around um, Martha's Vineyard and those surrounding areas and, and cast people in roles that, you know, wasn't too much of a stretch of the imagination for them. Um, so I've kind of honed in on those people and, and tried to show off that it's, very much a kind of community film because you know even to this day that there are jaws conventions that happen in those places where the film was shot and the community is still very proud of, of their involvement with that film um so i've kind of honed in on that i was recently lucky to chance upon a website that was called jaws 25 it's a bunch of guys tried to make a documentary um, for the 25th anniversary and they went and interviewed a lot of the local people. Some of them are no longer with us, sadly. Um, but um, the guy who ran this website and this documentary that they didn't finish um, basically gave me several hours of interview material that um, had never been released. Um, some of it's stuff we would have heard before, but a lot of it isn't. Um, so, and, and as I say, a lot of these people are the local people that were involved in either, you know, background or extras or sometimes photographers. Sometimes they were just people that were present there on set because they were fairly open sets, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's trying to, I'm trying to get a different perspective um, uh, working with that kind of material. Yeah, and I know it's going to take a while and, and, you know, there's a little thing called life and having a job <laughs> although although your job is pretty cool so you can't really kind of like me I, you, we like what we do so we can't really call it a job a job supposed True. to be somewhere where you don't like to go <laughs> um <laughs> but, but, I, but I know yeah. that those that may get in the way but how how soon do you expect inside jaws to be completed well my original intention was to get it released for the end of february i think that probably isn't going to happen partly because I, I, I moved house last year and I've been doing a lot of stuff. It's my first house. I bought my first house with my, my fiance. And, um, you know, there's a few things, there's always, there's always a to-do list, yeah. um, for the house before I get onto things like this. But Which, and also, for some reason seems to grow by on a daily basis. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, We've had a lot of cold weather over here in the UK at the moment, and the room which my iMac is in uh, is just so so damn cold. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm making excuses, but um, my intention is to get it out there before I start the Formula One uh, racing season again, which is kind of middle mid to end of March this year. Um, I've also one of the guys, um, James Brule, who was doing some animations for me on Ray. Reading the Lost Ark, he animated those comic sequences for the deleted scenes, which he did a fantastic job of. He um, off to help me out again with Jaws, and he's been a bit delayed again. You know, life gets in the way, job gets in the way, so we have kind of pushed that back. And I'm getting a second animation, hopefully done by another guy who uh, came across on Twitter and was recommended by a friend. So, you know, I'm outsourcing a couple of little bits as well, um, more so this time. Um, and of course, it depends on other people's situations as well. So, but. The, sh the short answer is end of March, hopefully. Yeah, and, and again, you know, we, we say it every time you come on. We gotta say it again. You do this for the love of these films. You're not doing this for profit. And I'm, I'm assuming the people who help you out, they they don't do it for a profit either, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I had a friend of mine do some poster work for me, and he was gracious enough to, um, in the same way that I do, just do it purely for the love of the films. And he presented me with a lovely framed edition of the poster and. Some Thing I've done recently, um, just just trying to kind of get across the message of goodwill that I have with these things. And as I said before, many times I don't make any money on it. Um, I, I've invited people to make donation towards the upkeep of the website, and I think in the two years that I've had the website, I've paid for three quarters of a year of it with donations, which I'm very grateful to receive. But recently, I put a link to a charity that means a lot to me, um, and asked people that if they felt that they enjoyed my films and they wanted to show a bit of love and they could make a small donation to the charity. And if they did, if they let me know that they've done so, I'll send them a, um, an inside jaws signed poster signed by me and the artist that did it. 
Um, so I sent a bunch of those out to data, some very kind individuals that, that did donate. So, you know, I do these out of just love of the films and off my own back and I enjoy doing them. And I hope other people enjoy watching them. And if, you know, if they do want to do want to thank me in some way, then, you know, it's a, it's a good way of, um, of, of, of showing their appreciation by donating to a charity. So I'm happy for people to do that. Yeah, he's Jamie Benning. He, you know him from all the films. The phenomenal film we mentioned we've done before. The Star Wars, Waiting the Lost Ark, and now Inside Jaws coming hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, uh, Jamie, I can't let you go over in the middle of, of an interview, like I said, with... Uh, we're talking J.J. Abrams and Star Wars. You're a big Star Wars fan, obviously, since you did the first film we on Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Let me get your reaction. First, a reaction to the announcement last year that Disney acquired Lucasfilm, and now that J.J. is officially the director. What, what are your thoughts on that? I was initially taken aback by the news that uh, George had sold to Disney. Um, I just didn't see it coming, and I was told by somebody at breakfast in a hotel that I was staying in in Abu Dhabi. Um, it was kind of a surreal experience. Um, it took a few days to sink in. I wasn't quite sure what to do with that kind of news, but the recent um, development that J.J. Abrams is involved, I think I've got a, a good feeling about it. Um, I really enjoyed his um, Star Trek film. I really enjoyed Super 8. It seemed to tap into that kind of 80s vibe. Um, you know, it, it felt like the Goonies it, it, and, and, and then the Star Trek felt like I wanted to see the next episode when I came out of that Star Trek movie. And I think that's what I came out of uh, um, The Empire Strikes Back thinking, you know, I want to see the next episode. I want to I see what happens to these characters. I've invested in these characters. And I've recently read some, some stuff about J.J. Abrams' views on Star Wars and how his focus was always on these relationships between the main characters rather than these peripheral characters, yeah. um, which I think a lot of the expanded universe novels and, you know, cartoons and action figures and games and everything else have concentrated on. So hopefully the focus will return. And I think somebody at Disney clearly knows their original Star Wars because, um, you know, they've, they've employed Lawrence Kasdan again. J.J. Abrams is a good choice. I think things like recent the recent comic um, by Brian Wood, um, which is just entitled Star Wars, which looks at the period uh, uh, after after the original Star Wars film and before The Empire Strikes Back, is concentrating on, again, on those characters, those central characters and, and their concerns and where they're coming from and where they're going to and treating treating it as a world rather than showing it off, which I think was part of the problem with the prequels. You know, George got carried away and showed off the worlds and kind of lost the, that thread that the original trilogy had. So I got my fingers firmly crossed about JJ and uh, I, I tweeted Bad Robot this morning and said, you know, which is his production company, you know, just reminded them whilst in his research, you should check out my film inventories and uh, if he needs anything else, just to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I've got, you know, I've got a relatively good feeling about it. My initial reaction to the Disney news was kind of, ah, well, Star Wars is, is, doesn't really matter to me anymore. You know, I'm just a kind of a original trilogy fan. I was never a fan of the prequels or the, um, the cartoons or anything. So, but to be honest, the news that JJ Abrams is involved has kind of reawakened my interest a little bit. So I just think I'm just a bit concerned that the internet may crash when the first teaser is uh, released. So like you guys heard me um, a, a second ago, uh, we're all on board. We're all, we're all with Jamie. Y- yes, I'm, we're glad JJ's a producer and director, and uh, I expect nothing but big, huge things from Star Wars to come from Episode 7, 8, 9, and whatever else they decide to do with it. Jamie, Benny, thanks a lot for coming on. Again, Inside Jaws coming hopefully sooner rather than later. Check everything out, all, all the updates on filmimentaries.com. You can go to our link section. It's all in there for, for you. Jamie, you know you're welcome anytime here. Thanks, Henry. Always feels a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, I always feel welcome. Thanks very much for that. Okay, thanks for the update. We'll talk to you later. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. It's time for the Geek Speak Show Book Club. <laughs> Our books or graphic novels. Tell us what your favorites are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. All right, I'm going to play yeah. Joel today and not have a book because I don't read any Yeah. Book. But you guys do. I'm going to play Henry, and I'm going to talk about a book... With words and Not everything. Not a graphic novel. A book. A book. 
<sighs> but I'm gonna let Jay start first. No! <laughs> oh, Call it. I said it. I said the microphone, and now you have to go first. <laughs> he threw me under the bus, man. Um, I have a big That's what friends are for big heavy metal cover book that I'm going to use to bludgeon Joel as soon as we're done recording. Um, Adamantium. If only we were doing the video show, that would <laughs> exactly. be a good video. Uh, we'll we'll steal his phone and use the camera on it. I said vibranium, not <laughs> whatever you're thinking about. Adamantium. You think about your mommy with those thoughts? <laughs> no, no. And that's what the book club is for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's called Superheroes: Fashion and Fantasy by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Yale University Press. Woo, that's Ooh. a lot of words for not a lot of words. Uh, it's mostly glossy <laughs> magazine pages, kind of tied together by thematic and yearly reviews of mainstream fashion and how it has influenced superhero fashion and vice versa, been influenced by superhero fashion. Uh, mainstream comic books: Superman, Spider Man, Wonder Woman, Catwoman. Um, um, all of that good stuff, plus much, much more. The introduction of Tron lines to mainstream fashion, um, how some things go in and out of style. It's uh, it's it's a lot of fun, and uh, I'm definitely going to use it not just as a weapon to to kill Joel, but also <laughs> no, as, Jay, no, <laughs> not now, later when you're not expecting it. But also, I uh, I really like it sleep as a reference. With one eye open. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you live, and I've seen where you sleep. <laughs> I like to use it as a reference for when who? doing character designs for my own writing. So, Joel. Okay, guys, I'm glad you're listening to me. Today we're talking about another book. I mean, a real book, real, real book. It's by Michio Kaku, the Japanese scientist, shall I say? And it's called Hyperspace, a scientific odyssey through parallel universes, time warps, and the 10th dimension. Dimension, dimension, dimension. (laughs) It was published in 1994 by Anchor Books. I'm very AP style, so I like to... uh, mention the publisher cite your sources the year, you know bibliography Just, it's not real unless i mention the uh la teca who, la teca who, la who biblioteca it. it's basically one of those crazy scientific books talks about all those crazy things like time travel oops dropped my coffee mug <laughs> <laughs> time travel time warps Let's tenth, do the tenth the dimension like i said again. parallel universes wormholes all that kind of Jazz crazy hands. scientific stuff i wanted to bring it up because I didn't have a book for this weekend. I just like, no, no, I'm kidding. I brought it up because we're talking Star Wars for this show. And if you oh, want no, to Trek. break Star down Trek. Star Wars, especially the hyperdrive that they always talk about, then you have to talk about hyperspace. There's Again, creatures and blasters Michio Kaku, and old Jedi hyperspace, at the Star Wars. Published by Anchor Books. <laughs> That's the Geek Speak Show Book Club. Tell us what your favorite books or graphic novels are. Books at thegeekspeakshow.com. Hey, this is Todd McFarlane, creator of Spawn, and one of the original founders of Image Comics. And you're listening to Geek Speak Show. Thanks for coming. And staying, and we're talking about J.J. Abrams, the director, producer of Episode 7, whatever it's going to be called. Consensus says we're all happy. We're glad. I am for sure. I'm a big JJ fan, like, I, like I've always said. We're glad that it's happening. Can't wait. Tw- Does anybody here have a DeLorean? Can it be 2015 already? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so My friend Ernie Klein actually owns one. Uh, Ernest Klein. He wrote Fanboys and the great novel Ready Player One. If you're at all into 80s pop culture and video games, I suggest you grab a copy of Ready Player One because it's a great book. And Ernie drives around in a DeLorean. Yeah, and yeah he has a picture of it in the back. In the back of the book, a, I mean. the flux capacitor, actually, right there in the back seat. Very cool. Yeah, and I got to mention, because I haven't mentioned it in a while, but Ernie Klein and I have been talking back and forth. He's He's been wanting to come on the show, but, you know... His schedule conflicts with our schedules, and but he'll be on for sure. If, if not, he's going to be at WonderCon, so maybe we'll just do something there for all of you guys. Yeah, you but, should. You should because uh, Ernie's a great guy. Yeah, he is. Uh, that's Jimmy Mack, by the way, another great guy. And his co-host not with us here, Jason Swank. He, they, they used to be the host of uh, ForceCast, the official podcast of uh, theforce.net. Now they moved over to Rebel Force Radio, their own thing. You can find it on rebelforceradio.com. There's a link up on our link section. You can go. You can take you there directly. Um, since you're here, Jimmy, tell us all about Rebel Force Radio. The first question is, is, is why? why? Why the move? Why the move to Rebel Force Radio? Well, yeah. after about um, seven years of being the host of the Force cast, 
uh, we've, uh, you know, we, we've been through a lot. We've had a lot of experiences with the crew over there and they're a bunch of great guys and uh, we love them like family. But with the announcement that the Star Wars saga is going to continue back in uh, late October, we really began to sort of look around at our environment and our situation and we wanted to be in a position moving forward where we could establish something maybe a little more fresh and something that we can definitely say is independently ours and that it's something that we can use to provide a strictly unfiltered look at the upcoming Star Wars films and the past of Star Wars. So we decided, you know what, let's just take a leap of faith. Let's trust our guts here and try to start our own thing. And it was a big gamble for us because we didn't know if we were just going to lose our audience altogether. And I'm happy to say that that didn't happen at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe we've picked up a lot of new audience, a lot of new listeners because of the fact that we are now out there and available to all. We're not underneath a singular umbrella when it comes to Star Wars fans. We're in a situation where we can go wherever the story will take us. And that's something that we couldn't do in our, our prior um, arrangement uh, because we were part of a website and part of a team. And the focus is on the website and the team. I think Jason and myself really wanted to have the focus be strictly on Star Wars podcasting and not have any sort of outside distractions as we move forward into this new era of Star Wars. And it's also a statement about growing up, about leaving your uncle's moisture farm and going out on your own adventure. And the only way you can go on your own adventure is if you create your own path to walk forward into the future on. If you walk through on a path that belongs to someone else, it, then it's not your adventure. And that's, um, you know, that's a very Joseph Campbell sort of thing to say. And Joseph Campbell is a guy who really inspired George Lucas and, and, and George studied the works of Campbell extensively as he developed his Star Wars mythology. And I can appreciate that. And it helps me connect more to Star Wars and more to the mythology overall, if I am able to understand and actually experience what it means to go on your own adventure. So, yeah, I know that, you know what, this sounds pretty heavy and everything, but I, it's been a lot of, of inner thought going on here. Very introspective time for us, because like I said, it was a gamble and something we were nervous about, but we wanted to show that we're big boys and we can do it all by ourselves. And so far, so, so good. It's been a real breath of fresh air for Jason and myself. Jason, by the way, he, he regrets he couldn't make it here today, but he had a, he had some, uh, some things pop up, uh, in his, his day job that, uh, prevented him from making it. So he had to go pick up some power converters. <laughs> yeah, right. He's at Tosh <laughs> station. Um, wasting time with his friends, but, um, but no, Jason's a very busy guy. And, uh, and so we just wanted to have to avoid being in situations where we need to fly things up a certain flagpole or get permission to do this or do that. We just wanted to be in charge of our own destiny and establish our own thing and be independent. And that's what Rebel Force Radio is all about. And with Rebel Force Radio comes the same attention to production standards we've always had with uh, our old show, The Force Cast. And also, all of our friends and contacts have come along with us, too. And uh, thus far, we've had shows with, uh, just in the last three weeks, with uh, Matt Lanter, who's Anakin Skywalker on Star Wars The Clone Wars, of course, supervising director Dave Filoni, uh, Jamie King, actress, um, uh, who else have we had? We uh, Oh, uh, this week we have Sam Witwer joining us. And uh, Sam is a great actor himself. You see him on Being Human on Sci-Fi, but he's known to Star Wars fans as the voice of Darth Maul on Star Wars The Clone Wars. He's a very passionate fan, and he can have his own Star Wars podcast, as far as I'm concerned, because he can really talk the wars. And so that show will be coming out uh, this Friday, February 1st. Um, and so it's just been a lot of fun to reconnect with our friends, reconnect with not only our old listeners, but expose ourselves to a big, broad audience of Star Wars fans everywhere. And 
like I said, it's just been a breath of fresh air and a, a great experience thus far. So now that you guys have this kind of renewed focus and, and you feel all like you've, you've got all the power and, and the drive that you need to do your own thing, what do you think is going to be the biggest change that we're going to see between then and now? Um, as far as uh, Star Wars or as far as Star Wars podcasting? Well, as far as the podcasting for you guys. Okay. Um, I, I don't think our listeners will really notice any change at all. Um, in our prior uh, relationship with TFN, uh, we were pretty much an island, the Force cast, as, uh, as it was when uh, Jason and myself produced it. Um, we had collaborations coming from not only uh, some of the website guys, but from uh, all of our contacts in general and our listeners. And so it, it was a group effort, yes, but it was primarily Jason and myself exclusively producing and booking and performing on these shows and editing them and releasing them and all that. So, so we bring all of that with us to Rebel Force Radio. And I don't think the listeners will notice much of a difference at all. Um, most people have said it's been relatively seamless. If anything, they've noticed um, there's some new production, of course, with a new show comes uh, some new production. And uh, I've had a, a great time putting all that together. And a lot of people are really getting off on that. And people say they, they're hearing a lot more energy and a lot more relaxed energy coming from me and Jason too. And so that's, that's why I think the biggest difference will be is that if anything, uh, we'll still be presenting the same standard of star Wars podcasting, but there'll probably be, probably be a lot more um, excitement and energy be, behind what we do because we're very enthusiastic about what's to come in the future. As far as star Wars is concerned. Do you guys have any plans to take what you're doing now with the podcast and rebel force radio and turn it into something even larger? Well, of course, you know, you always have have these aspirations and um, <laughs> the fact that I am in the radio industry, I'm, I'm always looking at different ways of getting the show out there. As a matter of fact, we're heard on Sundays here in the Chicago area on 1530 a.m. WCKG at 2 p.m. Central. And so that's just another outlet, another way of exposing ourselves to Star Wars fans. And the reason WCKG put us on is because they believe in the fact that Star Wars fans are a mainstream audience. They're not just relegated to what would be geek or nerd culture. That's so true. It, it's because, and I mean, obviously the box office numbers represent that a great deal. And they feel it's, uh, it's important to get a, a passionate word out there uh, as far as uh, Star Wars fandom goes. So where where can that lead? You never know. Um, to which actually we, we can say, well, it's about time you recognize this. Yeah, right. Right. You know, yeah. we have a lot to say and we have a lot of people who want to hear what we have to say. So, you know, that audience is making up your mainstream general population. And why not tap into that? You know, sports radio is very accepted, very common. We kind of approach Star Wars podcasting like sports radio in the fact that we don't have to dumb things down for our audience. We know who's listening. So we can speak the same language. We've all watched the same things, movies or TV shows, much like with sports radio. You watch a game, then you listen to sports radio to hear opinion, commentary, analysis, feedback, you name it. We treat Star Wars the same way. We see a Star Wars film or a television show or any sort of media, and we talk about it on Rebel Force Radio. And then that gives Star Wars fans a place to go to hear commentary, opinion, discussion, analysis, you name it. And it's so it's the same way as, as how sports radio works, in my opinion. It's just that sports radio is something that's generally accepted and is caught on everywhere. And maybe 10 years from now, we'll have Star Wars and Geek Speak programming on mainstream radio across the country. You know, uh, you, you never know who's listening. You never know who might want to be in a position to help you, who's into what you're doing. So the only way you can find out is just by putting it out there and talking to people and networking and just to see where it goes. Never be afraid to put your foot through the door because it could lead to something amazing. And as long as you're following something you're very passionate about, here I go into Joseph Campbell again, follow your bliss and doors will open where you never expected they existed. And so that's sort of a leap of faith we take with podcasting, kind of a leap of faith I take with, with just about anything I do in life. But 
for me, the connection to Star Wars and that I know it's fiction, but you want to tap into the force in some way, shape or form. You want to have that comfort of knowing you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're fulfilling your destiny. And without sounding too preachy or anything, that's just a way I like to approach any sort of creative thing I do or career oriented thing I do or family oriented thing I do. So that's just uh, something that fuels me as far as why I keep coming back to Star Wars so much. What makes me so passionate about it and why it matters. So this and is, that's why we like guys like Jimmy Mack from exactly. RebelForceRadio.com. Right, Henry? Yeah, I was going to say, that's exactly why I used to listen to both of you guys. Because Jimmy, I, I could tell right away, could, uh, you know, I'm, I've been a radio guy for, I almost hate to admit it, almost going on 30 years now. Um, I could tell that you were a pro so when you, when you and Jason get, got on there. And I love the way you presented the show. And I fo- I'm one of the guys, I'm one of the many who followed you now to Rebel Force Radio. We'll be there. Um, and, and you're right. I've, I've been to, uh, I've run you no know, national network, national talk networks, and they're they're figuring out like, hey, you know, they see Comic Con, they're not just Star Wars, but they see Comic Con and the Avengers movies, the comic book movies, all this stuff. And, and, and like you said, there's, they're finally starting to realize that yeah, there is an audience out there that wants to hear this stuff, and, and the comparison is perfect. Talk, I mean, uh, sports radio, we're doing the same thing here, except we're talking about you know Spider Man, Star Wars, J.J. Uh, Abrams, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, all that stuff. There is an audience out there, and with people like Jimmy, Jason, myself, and everybody else who does podcasts, like our other friend Chris Hardwick, who used to, who's an old radio guy, also, it's coming. Yet yeah, we're coming to a station, a radio station, TV, every, anything near you. So get ready for it, because it's going to be our time pretty soon. Well, you never know. I mean, there's uh, also satellite radio, which yeah. which could be home for this sort of content. But uh, I really feel comfortable in the realm of podcasting because, as I said before, going independent is something that's very important to us. And podcasting just in general offers you that independence. And as a radio guy, you understand that you're free of the confinement of FCC regulations and and programming clocks and commercial breaks and all these things and and consultants and program directors and people and telling you to, yeah 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 right ratings <laughs> people telling you what to do salespeople telling you how to to perform and do your craft and and judging you and all that all that gets thrown out the window when you do podcasting and the best thing about it is that you're not often fueled by things like money or ratings or anything like that you're fueled by your passion and that's what keeps you coming back week after week and with rebel force radio when it comes to star wars there are a lot of very passionate opinions out there on the internet and everything we always try to keep our coverage of Star Wars, very positive. Sure, we get opinionated sometimes. Sure, we get feedback from listeners who get upset about some of our opinions. But you know what? We're just people. We're not corporations. We're not networks. You know, we're not relegated by the FCC. We're just people talking into a microphone about something we we eat, drink, and sleep. And that is Star Wars. So we try to keep it positive. So it's a positive experience for everyone. Because for me growing up, Star Wars was a positive in my life and something that I've always maintained as a positive. So I'm not really into vernacular like George Lucas raped my childhood and and hideous (laughs) things like that, that people say. See, I I love you guys for that. I just gave you a sound bite you could totally take out of (laughs) context. That's what I was thinking. (laughs) Yeah, bastard. But, um, (laughs) But you know what? We, we keep it positive. We're fans of George Lucas. We're fans of Lucasfilm. We're fans of Star Wars and the mythology that surrounds it. And we try to dig deep into it and always, always, always keep it positive. Yeah, so again, you guys can go to our link section. It's all on there for you. Yeah, make sure you subscribe. iTunes. I mean, how, how, how often do you guys update? Oh, um, gosh. We, we put out a, a weekly show every Friday. And we also do a second show that is a exclusive discussion about Star Wars The Clone Wars. It's called Clone Wars Declassified. It's a roundtable discussion about the latest episodes of that show. And we usually have some great guests on with us. This week we have former LucasArts David Collins will be with us. He uh, 
played uh, the character of Proxy in The Force Unleashed, and he's also a stage host at Star Wars Celebrations and an all-around great guy and a truly talented guy and someone who just loves Star Wars. He's not even with LucasArts anymore, and he is, is finding himself more and more involved in Star Wars than ever before through outlets like Rebel Force Radio and Star Wars Celebration. So he's a great guy. Also joining us will be F.J. DeSanto. F.J. is a filmmaker. He uh, was a producer on the film The Spirit, and he also is a huge Star Wars fan and all-around great guy. As a matter of fact, F.J. DeSanto co-wrote Smuggler's Gambit, which is a play I produced. It was directed by Kyle Newman out at Star Wars Celebration 6 in Orlando just this past summer. So uh, not only do we collaborate with our guests on our show, but it leads to other relationships and creative collaborations outside of podcasting too. And that's something that is very exciting to me. And as far as just my personal fulfillment as both a fan and someone who considers himself to be a professional, when I get into relationships with people where we can start feeding off our creative energies and make something and then fill up a theater in Orlando with over 2000 people. And when it's over, we get a standing ovation. I don't want to take the credit for that. We had a great cast. It was all the actors from the clone wars. Uh, and they did a fantastic job with the script and we were firing off sound effects live. You can hear this on at starwars.com. Just go to, um, starwars.com slash smugglers gambits and you can download an mp3 of this radio drama that we performed live out at celebration it was awesome but i mean that's just a, a great example of 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 the networking that podcasting can bring you to and when you all are passionate about something like we are about star wars it makes developing friendships very easy, very easy, because we're all speaking the same language. It's just like with our listeners. I, I've made lifelong friends with people who have just, you know, people all over the world. They just happened to stumble across Rebel Force Radio and started listening to us and reached out to us. And then we meet up at conventions and stuff. And I mean, some of these people are, are like dear friends of mine now. And, and we've only met in person a handful of times, but we feed off of each other's passion and energy. And it's a one hand washes the other sort of thing too. We never take our listeners for granted. We always are tapping into their creative skills and they, they collaborate with us all the time. There's not a single show that goes by where we're not at least using an idea that came from a listener or reading an email from a listener or listening to a voicemail. And, uh, and nowadays that now that me and Jason are the only people working on rebel force radio, essentially we see everyone's email and we respond to everyone's email. When you get an email from us, it's coming from either Jason or myself. When you see a post from us on the, the social networking platforms, that's a post from either Jason or myself, nobody else. There's, there's not many cooks in our kitchen and that's kind of the way we like it. And that's sort of why we broke free to do our thing on our own at this time. The timing was right for it. Uh, our, uh, our level of enthusiasm was right there. It just seemed like the stars all lined up and everything just fell into place. And so we're so happy in our new home at Rebel Force Radio. So that's a long way of answering your question about how often we release shows. <laughs> as far as uh, Clone Wars to Classified goes, you can uh, pretty much download those the week after the show airs. The new episodes air on Cartoon Network on Saturday. So we usually get those shows out. Wednesdays or Thursdays. Uh, we typically record on Tuesday nights. So, uh, you know, and, and when, when we do record, we're recording for like four hours at a time because we're doing two shows. And uh, so uh, then I go through all that material uh, over the course of the next 24 hours and then we start releasing it when it's uh, ready to be put out there. So typically two releases a week and uh, we have other shows. We have the Bond cast and uh, that's a monthly look at uh, the James Bond uh, franchise film by film. Um, I do podcasting with my wife on a show called Snide Remarks Radio. My wife, Wendy Snyder, is a pretty well-known and popular Chicago radio personality in her own right. And uh, I just released a, another show called uh, Black Hawk Talk, all about the Chicago Blackhawks. Very focused audience there, but it's a very low maintenance thing. Just me and my buddy talking about the Hawks once a week. So lots going on. Lots going on. Yeah, and something for everyone. He and is some, he's Jimmy was. Mack along with Jason Swank. They are the hosts of Rebel Force Radio, the same great show you guys heard on the on the Force Cast. If you didn't, 
great time to jump on board. Rebel Force Radio, go to our link section. It's all on there for you. You can capture everything downloaded and be there for the new shows. Jimmy, thanks a lot for coming on. You're welcome back along with Jason. If he can, anytime. we got a lot to talk about, obviously, in the years to come. Like I said, you're always welcome here on the show, on the Geek Speak Show. Yes, we'll thanks be calling you. All right, Henry and Rachel, you guys are doing a great job over there at uh, Geek Speak, so keep it up. Uh, like I said, awesome production work. I really, <laughs> really like it. Was, Thanks, Jimmy. Like, on the way, when I heard that come through, I was like, wait a second, is this a podcast or am I going on uh, some syndicated <laughs> radio show? It sounded fantastic. So you got my appreciation there. Thanks for that, Jimmy. And, and Rachel, go ahead and take it. You know what you want to say. All right, you guys. Tune in next week where we are going to speak more geek. The Geek Speak Show will be back next week with a brand new episode. In the meantime, follow them on Twitter at Geek Speak Show 1. That's the number one. Become a fan on Facebook. Subscribe on iTunes. Watch special event coverage and the Geek Speak Video Show on YouTube slash Geek Speak Videos. And listen to past shows in the archive section on thegeekspeakshow.com. A big thank you to the Geek Speak Show's content providers, geektyrant.com, collider.com, ramascreen.com, and mightyville.com. The Geek Speak Show.